This talk is the first in three talks on quantitative genetics that you'll be doing. Uh, and as you'll see, this will get us started with the topic, but will not take us all the way through. So first, let's understand the difference between Mendelian uh, and quantitative genetics. When we talk about a Mendelian trait, what we're talking about is a trait controlled by one or some very small number of loci. Um, and what happens because of this, because of being controlled by such a small number of loci, is that the traits tend to fall into distinct categories. So, for example, uh, Mendel's peas fell into categories. You know, the peas could be round or they could be wrinkled. They could be yellow or they could be green. Uh, but these were categorical differences, not continuously uh, varying changes. For quantitative traits, though, and this is true of most traits that we would want to talk about, they don't have distinct categories. So uh, they don't end up being produced by one or a very small number of genes. Instead, uh, they're produced by the action of many, many loci acting in combination. And this is what gives them their continuous variation. So a good example of this is human height. And what you're seeing here is a frequency distribution uh, made of people of different heights. And each column is a uh, people of a particular height. The tallest ones are over here on the right, and the shortest ones are over here on the left. And as you can see, it forms a kind of a distribution uh, of heights. Uh, that's what we use these frequency distributions to do, is just to sort of give us a sense of how uh, the various values are distributed. So we can talk about basically three types of selection acting on uh, continuous traits or quantitative traits. The first one is stabilizing selection, and let me orient you to how these various slides are going to look or how these different pictures are going to look. What we have is a frequency distribution here, and then the yellow part within the frequency distribution is the part where selection acts on. So in other words, selection is favoring, in this case, things that are close to the mean of the distribution. And this is referred to as stabilizing selection. What happens in stabilizing selection is that the mean stays the same. You'll note that the mean represented by this line is staying the same, but the distribution changes. The variation around that mean is more constrained here under stabilizing selection. And this happens because selection is favoring individuals that have a mid-range value for whatever the trait is. So it could be height, for example. So people who are neither too tall nor too short tend to either survive better or have more offspring. Another type of selection is what we call directional selection. So in this case, what happens is selection favors one of the extremes of distribution. And the extreme that's being favored here uh, is the larger individuals, okay, shown here. Now what happens in the next generation under this type of selection is that the mean value actually moves. This white line was the original mean value for this population. And after selection in the next generation, this black line is the new mean value. So you'll note that what's happened is we've completely shifted uh, the population over to the left. We've increased the average body size in the population. And this third type of selection is something we call disruptive selection. This is a situation where both of the extremes are favored, but not individuals in the middle range of values. So here, really large individuals are favored, or, or really small individuals are favored. And this results in uh, a distribution where you're getting disruption of the initial value. And we're getting two peaks now. So instead of having a monotonic situation where there's just one peak, we have a diatonic situation where there are two peaks. And if this goes on long enough, you'll actually get two separate groups of small and large individuals in this case. In this graph, what we're seeing are the results of two different directional selection experiments. What was done here, and this is pretty fascinating because it's a really long-term experiment. It's actually been going on for over 100 years now. An original line of corn was, uh, was taken, and in one case, populations of that corn were selected to have increased oil content. Now, oil content is the proportion of the seed's weight 
that is made up of oil. So what we're doing here is we're selecting to increase the proportion of the seed that is made up of oil. And in another group, instead of selecting for increased amount of oil in the seed, there was selection for decreased amount of oil in the seed. And you can see that over a period of about 75 years here, because there's one generation per year, there's been substantial decrease of the oil content down almost to zero. It can, it can never go to zero because the seeds couldn't survive if there, were no, uh, if there was no oil in them. And a constant increase here of oil content going from about 5% to begin with up to 19% 75 years later. So there's quite a bit of variation here uh, for genetic variation here for oil content, both in terms of increasing it and in terms of decreasing it. The second uh, example that I want to show you is one from the Galapagos Islands. Now, you'll remember we talked about the Galapagos finches, uh, where Darwin uh, first had his thoughts about how biogeography could relate to uh, natural selection or to evolution in general. And there's been considerable work done on evolution uh, on these finches. And in particular, one of four major finches, this one here that I've just drawn a box around, Geospiza fortis, um, has undergone selection for what's called beak depth. Okay, so beak depth represents the, the, uh, the height of the beak from top to bottom. And what happens is uh, there are periodic droughts that go on during El Nino years uh, out on the Galapagos Islands. And during those dry years, there's very strong selection for increased beak depth. So we can see here that in 1977, there was a dry year and beak depth increased and then you had a series of wet years where it decreased, and then there was another drought in 1980 which increased the beak depth, and then it pretty rapidly went back down again. And then here in 1982, um, there was a, a, a dry year and the beak depth increased. And here we have a rare case of an extremely wet year which ended up selecting for uh, smaller beak depths than uh, what are routinely seen on the island. So these are traits that have been under selection, uh, quantitative traits that have been, un been under selection and have changed under that selective pressure. And we can actually see that here. This is a frequency distribution before selection of beak depths. You can see that the average was somewhere around nine uh, and a half millimeters. And then after uh, selection in 1978, uh, when only 90 of 751 birds ended up surviving, um, we have a shift in the beak depth to slightly greater than 10 millimeters. And this might not seem like a big difference, a half a millimeter, but it turns out for the purposes of, of cracking open large seeds, which was all that was left after the drought, um, large, very hard seeds, that that increased beak depth was very important to survivorship. 